to Why Won't Own Date These Guys. I'm Jewel Guy, and I'm by myself today. Um, I have subjected my wonderful sister, Naomi Guy, to over 15 hours of talking about one singular book, and I figured it was time to give her a break as I do just a retread of what we've already discussed, uh, but in a slightly more condensed form for this episode. Um, for those who are tuning in and have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, we used to be a dating advice podcast until we just started discussing one book. And that's pretty much what we did for the last like six months, discuss one book. And it's done. It's over. We finished just every part in excruciating detail. And unfortunately, now it's like, well, could we do a slightly better job? And realizing that maybe doing a one hour summary of the text might um, give more people an opportunity to understand how deeply flawed and damaging it is. Uh, before we get into that, um, as we do in every episode, I'm trying a drink today. It is Jaritos Mexican Cola. It's fine. Yeah, I don't know. It's Aritos. You get what you pay for. It's not going to win any awards. It's not going to offend anyone. It's uh, perfectly manageable. So let us try to condense this to one hour. I have a eight page summary of a 180 page uh, document. That was my summary of the overall book. I've attempted to shrink down all of my detailed arguments into a more condensed, more manageable, digestible form. Uh, hopefully this will be a little bit easier for people to understand who um, don't have the patience to sit through 15 hours of content. And I totally understand that. I personally would not want to listen to 15 parts of a book. That was very much an attempt to help people understand how incredibly flawed on every single level, every single thing that the author was saying was. So yeah, let's let's just get into this. So the book is called Why Women Deserve Less. People have asked, you know, why did I do this in the first place? Well, the book had a lot of what we'll say is unquestioned misogyny. A lot of people were reading it and taking away very positive things from it. And I felt there needed to be a very rigorous deep dive into all of the problems with what was being said. Also, Naomi didn't stop me. That's that's a big thing. Uh, if Naomi had put her foot down, I probably would have stopped. But she was like, eh, eh, that's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, she argued against it, but really not that hard. I would say also, I was thinking that this would only be about like a six part book series when we first started and as i started doing research it just got more and more in depth i didn't realize upon my first pass like how wrong the author was about everything um not only were the like arguments from a like logical and moral perspective kind of off-putting uh the evidence itself was um very very flawed and misrepresented and often misunderstood by the author himself so this type of book's talking about why women suck, drive off an argument style known as gish galloping, where they throw a lot of ideas at the reader and presume that no one can sufficiently respond to all of them. Uh, none of them are well-constructed or logical, but there are a lot of them, and that can be enough to fool people into thinking that arguments must have merit. Uh, they don't, and it's genuinely surprising how nearly every single claim he makes in this text is substantively wrong. The evidence he provides frequently contradicts what he says, and even when it aligns, it usually is presented by him without context that makes his argument looks even worse. He might say women are more likely than men to initiate divorces and provides a link to a law firm that supports that. And then you click on the link to the law firm and dig into it. And they're like, oh, yeah, women are more likely to initiate divorces. And they have really, really good reasons for doing so, like household chore division. We find that's a big source of complaints. So, yeah, just a lot of unexamined evidence. He kind of came up with his ideas and then found research to support it, which is not really how you do any form of science. Um, with science, you, you know, form hypotheses and go off what the evidence says and not the opposite way around. But, yes, if you have some sort of um, moral or philosophical argument to prove, you may they want to do it the opposite way is he did it. The other thing is there's an element of, dare I say, fascist rhetoric and a lot of well-coded but still very much present racism and xenophobia, something not helped by his less than reputable choice of sources. This book is poorly written, but it's also written to normalize a crap ton of hate, so it's kind of worth, in my mind, pushing back against it. So just some general background about this book. The person who wrote it is named Myron Gaines, real name Amro Fudel, who is a former Department of Homeland Security agent, good person, current fitness dating guru podcaster, and maybe also still a real estate agent. It says so on his website. I'm not sure if he is known for his real estate advice, but maybe he does that in his spare time. He runs a podcast called Fresh and Fit, where he mainly just invites pretty women on to make fun of them, but then also says a lot of racist and sexist stuff and platforms people like neo-Nazi Nick Fuentes. Uh, not cool. 
He releases this book in February of 2023. It shot up the charts on Amazon, becoming not only one of the most sold dating relationship books, but also one of the most well-reviewed on the entire platform. Uh, keep in mind, there are nearly 39 million books on Amazon at the time of recording, so that's uh, a little concerning. As of right now, it has a 4.8 star rating with 2,200 reviews. It was at the time that I pulled these numbers, which is, I think, last week, 12,316 in books. It was number five in medical psychology of sexuality. It was number eight in psychology and counseling books on sexuality and number 21 in dating. And that's really where my eyebrows went up because boy, howdy, there's a lot of damage that this can do. Already, there's a lot of really bad dating books out there. And the fact that this one has just such incredible enthusiasm, such fervent support from people indicated to me, eh, maybe I should spend some time digging into it. So it's a book written by a misogynist that has blown up and become super popular. Uh, if you read the reviews, they're almost all like, this has taught me the truth about dating, which means we should probably figure out why they think that and then push back against it. We also discussed this in episode one and then just kind of took it for given throughout the rest of our 15-part series. It's very likely that Myron Gaines, the person whose name is on the cover, didn't actually write the book. The book says it was edited by a guy named Aaron Clary, who has written a number of women drool, men rule style books, and has spoken of glowingly throughout the text. The book discusses nearly identical ideas to some of his other books, like Bachelor Pad Economics. He's the only person that Aaron even gives credit to. Sorry, Myron, who making that mistake already. He's the only person that Myron even gives credit to in the dedication besides his parents, not even this podcasting co-host. The editing of the book is garbage, with frequent misspellings and a complete mess of a citation list. And his website mentions that he offers ghostwriting services to people who don't want to do the work and write the books themselves. This isn't crucial to our issues with the book, but it does provide a whole hell of a lot of context. Um, I unfortunately read two other books by Aaron Clary in order to better understand his thinking and provide some arguments against his overall logic. Um, and we kept returning this idea nearly every chapter because it explains some of the weird underpinnings, whether it be like fascist libertarianism, almost a romantic asexual approach to dating uh, that kept being brought up throughout the text. So let's jump in. Chapter one is titled What You're Up Against. And it's literally just a quote from pickup artist guru Rolo Tomasi's book, The Game. This book cribs ideas liberally from author Rolo Tomasi, who's kind of the godfather of modern red pill pickup culture movements. I guess this adds credibility, like, I know who this is, Myron saying, Aaron saying, I know who this is, and I'm agreeing with him. But it also seems like Aaron knows less than Rolo, and you should just put this down and read the game instead. At least that's my perspective. Maybe someone else who's reading this is like, oh, you know who that is. Maybe that, you know, makes them more likely to continue reading. I don't know. Uh, you really should not read uh, Rollo's book, The Game. It's misogynistic drivel. The books could kill, if books could kill, podcast did a really good takedown on it, noting that even in the text of the book, it describes how the pickup artist techniques described by Rollo became commonplace and unhelpful in Los Angeles because so many men were doing the exact same thing and women were picking up with it. It's why women are aware of things like negging. They just became so commonplace, so many men were using them that the techniques became completely useless. But anyway, Aaron is like, doesn't Rollo describe the modern dating market perfectly? And gives this quote that describes women as vain and vapid and possessing women's attention spans because so many men throw themselves at them. It's trying to pretend to be sympathetic and and is like, well, men would be this way too if we ha they had all this attention. But the way he describes women is super demeaning, like cats chasing laser pointers or small children. Anyway, we pointed out that you don't become arrogant by people constantly asking for your attention. Think of panhandlers or people asking you to sign petitions. Most people get annoyed and start tuning them out. Or when you ask women, they describe themselves as super afraid of men and constantly obsessing over whether it'll be attacked by needing men when out in public. We also pointed out that his stats on women's promiscuity are made up, surprise, surprise, and we're given an Oxford study we cite multiple times throughout this that analyzed tens of thousands of dating matches on eHarmony and found that men, who according to Rollo receive little attention and don't have high self-esteem, go after the most attractive of women on dating sites, while women, who according to Rollo receive huge amounts of attention and thus are arrogant, believe they deserve only the best, who go after men who are more average in appearance. Why is that? Uh, well, the Oxford study hypothesizes that women perceive super attractive men as less faithful or reliable. So that kind of blows this whole argument about women being attracted only to alpha chads out of the water. But he'll return to that concept over and over again throughout the book. Uh, this is also the first of many times he'll introduce a concept where men cause something that he considers bad to have happened, but he also refused to hold them accountable for their bad behavior. It's possibly because he considers that behavior to be fine. It's also possibly because he doesn't think men can change. Uh, either way, it's cool stuff. Chapter two is called Tom, Dick, and Harry. 
Uh, he opens this chapter up by giving three examples of the problems modern men face, which is kind of like writing a chapter called What You're Up Against, which describes serious problems modern men face. Um, yeah, he repeats ideas a lot throughout this. Tom is a hypothetical teenager who asks out a girl but is made fun of by her and her friends. Dick is a young adult who gets invited to dinner by a cute girl, but she flakes on him last minute and goes out with a beefy stud instead. Harry is an older man who wasted his life with two exes who took his money in divorces, and now he's stuck with a horrible crone nag of a wife who makes his life miserable. The tone of these descriptions is weirdly sexual, with him going into like incredibly specific details about how humiliated and powerless these men are. It's really not written like a tragedy, it's written like kink. So Aaron writes these long, drawn-out descriptions, taking 4.5 pages of a six-page chapter to describe all of these completely imaginary people. His overall point that he wraps up the chapter with is that men of all ages have issues with vapid evil women now, and dating has changed for the first time in over 200,000 years of human history. Thankfully now, he says, there are resources out there with the advent of the internet where men can share their knowledge about the world of modern relationships rather than suffer their entire lives like Harry. He then plugs, why women deserve less, as an example of the type of resource that can solve your problems. A plug which makes no sense because it would function much better as a thesis statement in an introduction, and people have already paid for or started reading this book, so there's no real need to keep marketing it. Are they going to buy another copy? Are they going to buy their friends' copies? Unclear. Or maybe the audience for this has like goldfish-like attention spans? I'm not really certain. A couple of things here. Uh, he really, really, really likes that 200,000 years of human history line and returns to it frequently in the text. Humans have indeed existed in their modern form for 200,000 years, but human civilization has only really existed for 6,000. He specifies human civilization existing for 200,000 years and says like all the dating patterns have been identical during that period. Um, he's saying cavemen hunting mammoths did relationships the same as everyone up until about the 20th century, which is untrue both probably from like a biological standpoint because it only took 20,000 years of people drinking milk for people to develop a dairy tolerance, so someone could imagine significant genetic variation over a period 10 times as long, but also because we've discussed relationship history over several books on this podcast. All of them describe major, multiple changes happening to relationships and family structures over hundreds of years from 13th century to present, and that's just in Western civilization. So the idea that people have been practicing courtship, practicing relationships, practicing marriage identically for 200,000 years is just categorically false. And the fact he continues to make this claim is kind of indicative of how he treats evidence. Um, our From the Front Porch to the Backseat episodes, or our Curious History of Dating episodes, go into a little more detail about that. Also, he never really narrows down when dating went wrong. He kind of implies throughout the text that it was 1960s, 1970s, which would imply women's suffrage is what ruined everything. But this is also after multiple major changes to relationship and family structures throughout the 20th century, which means dating has changed multiple times over the 200,000 years of human history, and this didn't ruin everything, but whatever. He also brings up a concept here that he returns to a few times, saying men are taught to do the right thing, while women are taught to do the right thing for you. So this is him saying women are selfish and they don't deserve anything. They've been handed everything on a silver platter. We pointed out that there's actually a huge imbalance of household labor that's done primarily by women that was only exacerbated by COVID, and that this doesn't jive with all the stats on women taking low-paying caregiving or education jobs. 95% uh, of child minders, for instance, are women. He even concedes that women do these jobs later in the text, but paints it as society letting them do useless jobs rather than requiring they work the same useful tasks as men, like, you know, accounting. We also talked about how media and porn often depicts the ideal for men as being like independent bad boys, while women are often depicted to be nurturers doing things for other people. So we kind of feel that the lessons society taught people are actually reversed, and he's depicting them the completely wrong way. This is also a minor thing, but addictive of a bigger problem. He did absolutely no research past finding articles that agreed with him. Like, I know I mentioned that at the start, but this becomes really, really apparent immediately. He acts like there have never been effective dating guides available to men until the advent of the internet, but even a basic knowledge of relationship or dating history will tell you that dating magazines and books were one of the most popular pieces of media in America since the late 19th century. People were always looking for and sharing advice about dating, and more importantly, people have always discussed problems in dating and relationships in public forums. Relationships and dating problems are not a new phenomenon, despite what he thinks. Chapter 3 is titled The Old Contract. So this brings up one of his core arguments in the text, and one that is fundamentally wrong. So chapter three is where he brings up his idea that relationships throughout 200,000 years of human civilization were always the same basic arrangement. And he dubs this arrangement the old contract. 
He says it boils down to men provided resources and protection, women provided sex, and, if wanted, children. He says this worked out great, but has been replaced by a new contract at some point in the last century, which he initially describes as, I don't need a man, men are trash, down to the patriarchy, believe all women. There's never really a coherent formulation of what the new contract is, but it seems to be something along the lines of, women can now survive in society independent of men, which he considers bad because it's unnatural and unfair. Initially, he paints that old contract as super simple, but quickly it becomes apparent that there's a lot of elements that he considers integral to this arrangement that he first hints at and then says are mandatory. This simple arrangement is actually super complicated, and that's all according to him. At times, he indicates that the old contract can only work in the confines of marriage, so partnered people in an identical arrangement actually aren't doing it right. They have to be religious to make this arrangement work, so secular people who believe in this relationship structure are doing it wrong. That women with tattoos or colored hair or higher education degrees or working in the workforce while raising their children aren't good partners for the arrangement, even if they're actively seeking one out. That women must have lots of children in order to make this work, even though he initially said that those were optional. That men can have actual money to support their partner. Sorry, men must have actual money to support their partner, not just resources, meaning poor farmers or hunters who can genuinely support a family and will never be marriage material. That non-binary individuals, people will send their kids to public school, people okay with open relationships, all of them are unfit for this arrangement, and so on and so forth. Once you start paying attention, it becomes increasingly clear that these aren't really rooted in anything other than his own preferences for relationships. Weirdly enough, they don't even map onto what right-wing influencers would often promote as important. Um, it's very strange, and if you read the text with any degree of skepticism, you'll see that this very simple arrangement he describes becomes actually incredibly complicated. There are numerous issues with his historical analysis, which of course he provides no evidence supporting. He seems to have a very Western view of relationships and wedding traditions, completely ignoring that other cultures can have very different relationship arrangements and ideas of love. Um, he also seems to think that many Western traditions have been around for thousands of years, even though things like white wedding dresses have only been popular for about 180 years. He completely ignores the idea that this arrangement would actually have been very bad for women, if it was indeed the case, and pretends that them leaving it behind was due to ignorance or arrogance, setting aside those horrible stats on spousal abuse, marital rape, or dying during childbirth that might have put women off of these traditions. If he's in fact correct, and this is how relationships have been structured since the beginning of human civilization, men have actually done a really shitty job upholding their side of the contract, namely the protection aspect of it. So women should have the ability to sever the contract and move on. He says we should do this because this arrangement is natural, citing absolutely no evidence, and leaning heavily into the appeal to nature fallacy. Just because some mammals murder their young, for instance, or eat their own feces, does not mean humans should mimic the same behaviors. But even if you think that the most common arrangement in nature is something that we should duplicate, the most common arrangement is not long-term relationships or pairings, but rather short-term flings between animals and heat. So he doesn't even get his, like, his nature appeal right. His next argument seems to be, it used to be men were entitled to women, and now they can't expect that. And since that makes them sad, we should really reconsider how that structured society. He explicitly says it's bad that men can no longer approach women randomly and then hit on them without being shamed, ignoring how awkward this is for women and how this basically means that even women in old contract relationships living traditional lifestyles will be hit on and objectified by those following his advice. This also ignores that this is the best time in human history to approach random women and hit on them. Any basic knowledge of history indicates that caste systems, religious differences, and racism or xenophobia meant that men approaching women randomly in the past would likely have been met with violence. He claims that most people in society still subscribe to this belief system, this old contract style belief system, which means that we should just treat it as valid, ignoring both public polling that indicates most people don't think marriage is essential for fulfilling life, slash not necessary for happiness in today's society, and that anyone born into a system that that's been around for thousands of years would not have had a chance to agree to the terms of the contract, so one might expect um, attempts at renegotiating per his own um, definitions. Uh, then he wraps up the chapter, saying everything good in human history came from attempting to seduce women and that we wouldn't have our civilization without it. Uh, his argument is literally you would not have your iPhone if men had not been entitled to women. 
before anyone listening thinks to bring up women's contributions to society, he literally says later that men have been the only ones contributing anything of value to society since the beginning of civilization, which kind of tells you what he thinks about women and what the value he places on men. Uh, I won't go into detail here. We do discuss this in one of our episodes, but um, yeah, women have been responsible for a lot. And it's frustrating that one of the main points his argument attempts to establish is that women have done nothing where you can literally Google what have women invented and come up with hundreds of items. So chapter four is titled The New Contract. In this chapter, he attempts to explain the new contract, which he very poorly articulated last chapter. Again, the whole men is trash vibes, which isn't really a contrast to the old contract formulation that he comes up with. Uh, He doesn't really explain when it took effect, uh, nor does he provide a quick explanation. It's just the general vibes that relationships are bad these days. This is perhaps the first indication that this book is attempting to wrangle men into right-wing conservative belief systems by starting with the simple observation that some stuff in society is wrong and building to the conclusion that it's all women's fault and only embrace the far-right policies and beliefs can solve the problems. So he starts by saying women are always attracted to men with resources and uses Beyonce's music as an example of women's hypocrisy. He says she sings about how independent she is but didn't leave Jay-Z when he cheated on her, indicating that all women everywhere will always cling to influential and powerful men. We found this pretty funny due to the breakups of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk in the last few years. Women married to arguably the most wealthiest, powerful, resource-filled men on the world, in the planet, left their partners, which kind of disproves his entire point. He says the problem now is that women used to be completely reliant on men throughout human history, ignoring both women's household labor, the jobs they worked to support their families, or even the calories they gathered in nature prior to human civilization, which research indicates comprised a greater caloric portion of hunter-gatherer lifestyles. However, now that they have options like living by themselves, they've tried to free themselves completely from the requirement that they settle down. He says this is due to capitalism making work easier and opening up lots of jobs for women that formerly only men could do, which is weird because he later defends capitalism fervently as the greatest thing for human civilization, while also indicating here that it's bad because it free women from its control. That said, his analysis is wrong. We discussed how women have been participating in the labor market for centuries and recognized and unrecognized roles. A third of the nation's women, for instance, were employed during World War II, and new research, I think the same research that won a Nobel Prize this year, uh, indicates that U.S. Census Bureau was undercounting women's participation in household businesses like boarding houses or farming for decades by not even giving an option to report an occupation for women in the household. Like, if a man's primary occupation was farmer, the census would not put down that the wife was probably a farmer, even though in a lot of rural areas, the wife would be doing identical or nearly identical work to support the farm. You know, churning butter, milking cows, um, fixing machinery, things like that. We also noted that capitalism has kept wages low, even as productivity has increased significantly in the last 50 years, making it harder for people to be independent in society, even as they generate more value for their employers. He also ignores all this unpaid labor women do around the house, so even when they work full-time, women are consistently doing more household work than men. He also conflates capitalism with the principle of limited government, and then also describes capitalism as the system which lets people keep the fruits of their labor, not a system where individuals profit from ownership of the means of production, and workers get whatever scraps the boss throws their way. Uh, We found this very funny, as Aaron calls himself an economist in other writings, and blogged about econ topics for years under the moniker Captain Capitalism. But if he, like, genuinely doesn't understand basic definitions of different forms of government or different forms of economic production, economic systems, um, it's perhaps indicative that he knows very little and is talking out of his ass a lot of the time. He says great men like Henry Ford, a person who modern history recognizes as a monster and fervent Nazi supporter, created so much innovation and technology that governments became incredibly rich and created the modern welfare states, which helped women to escape from men, which is a bad thing. He says marriages are in decline because of the modern welfare state. We pulled the numbers on percentage of GDP spent on welfare state spending and found that countries that spent more money actually had lower divorce rates on average than countries that spent less. Per his own logic, he should then encourage welfare state spending to encourage old contract marriages, but his personal beliefs on bootstrapping would probably prevent him from endorsing that. We also found this very funny because at least in America, both men and women benefit from social safety nets at roughly the same rates. Um, You know, 
they, they benefit often from different systems, but both of them, both genders, both sexes are benefiting. Uh, the less funny thing, however, is that he paints all of this aid as stolen from men while ignoring the very real good programs like CHIP uh, that prevent fatherless children from starving. Uh, he also ignores, or even seems to like, the hundreds of billions in corporate welfare and programs like the PPB initiative, which were giant giveaways to the wealthy. His only issue is women using welfare, not Wealthy people who are mainly men gaming the system. Perhaps that indicates something about his belief system. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I guess the big point here is if Aaron was attempting to look at the evidence and come up with ways to support his ideology and support the old contract, he might draw the conclusion that we should increase welfare spending. But because he's approached this with a ideological slant from the beginning, attempting to find evidence to support his beliefs, uh, he goes about it completely the wrong way. He says financial problems are the number one killer in relationships, and while one might think the modern welfare state should have made relationships stronger, uh, things like the birth control pill and feminism made them only grow worse. Uh, we looked at this and found that marital infidelity, spousal abuse, or unfair chore distribution also seem to be major contributors to breakups, but those don't allow him to paint men as victims and women as whores, so he just ignores that wholesale. In order to demonstrate how bad relationships have now become, he drops a bunch of stats all at once without any significant analysis. This is, again, the gish galloping style. We agree with the general idea that modern relationships have lots of issues, but disagree heavily with the reasons he states and the evidence. Um, I actually took the bait and independently evaluated every single piece of evidence he provided here and found that, according to his own evidence and then some supplementary stuff, while marriage rates have declined, so have divorces, implying that modern relationships are happier than ever that the people who divorce the most are actually people who were married under the old contract. This means that those relationships are actually worse. His own sources concede that women often divorce due to unhappiness with living arrangements like chore distribution, not because they want to sleep around. And one of the biggest reasons that there's been a decline in people having sex is because the percentage of the population that's older has risen significantly, and that due to the horrible economy capitalism has created, young people are behind, but still interested in all the stuff he says they no longer care about. Um, you know, a lot of people are living at home. That doesn't mean they don't want relationships. It means that they just can't afford anything. Um, again, that's not to say there are not serious issues with dating and relationships that make people miserable that he's exploiting to make his argument. I guess what we're saying is that he's wrong about the reasons for the trends and his own evidence it seemingly indicates modern relationships are stronger, not weaker, even if there are fewer total. After this, he claims all of this has coincided with the rise in laws exclusively give power to and benefit women, even though most women are stupid bimbos. And he proves this because he uses as evidence one of Myron's podcasts where a guest provided a less than perfect definition of misogyny. Hard-hitting stuff, as we've come to expect. This is the first of many times he argues with a great tactic used by fascists and other political groups, but mainly fascists, uh, to portray your enemies as simultaneously incredibly weak, being that women are stupid bimbos, but also incredibly strong, as women have taken over and manipulated every element of society. Uh, fascists want to portray their enemies as evil and responsible for all that's wrong with the world, but also something that can be easily defeated if everyone banded together and did the right thing. It's a big contradiction, but one he has to balance to make his argument that men are the victims in society and women don't deserve anything good. He says women spend all their time complaining about and trying to resolve imaginary issues like the wage gap in Me Too, which is weird because later he concedes the wage gap is real, but says it's because women are too lazy and selfish. He concludes by saying women also paint all men as oppressors to justify their actions, and this has further fractured the relationship between the two sexes, which is interesting because he pretends the very real issues women have with things like sexual assault aren't real and or serious problems that they contend with. He actually completely ignores the existence of abuse by men until one of the last chapters, and then he just kind of brings it up and says the reason women, women sometimes dance around discussing what they truly want is because they might have been beaten up in the past by their partner for voicing their true opinion. Which he then says is still very annoying that women sort of couch their responses to and desires because they're concerned of domestic violence. Um, this both indicates his disregard for women's suffering, but also the laziness of his writing. The existence of abuse is a very real problem women face, and it's one of the reasons they may be reluctant to enter in relationships or why they break up with partners. He spends the first half of the book acting like they have no good reasons for avoiding men, and then concedes 15 pages from the end of the text that they do have good reasons for avoiding men, but does so only to call them annoying. Truly, Aaron, one of the great intellectuals of our time, this one. Chapter 5, The Ugly Truth. So he's discussed the old contract, he's discussed the new contract, and now he's going to spend a chapter discussing the idea that most women are not interested in dating most men. Uh, he treats this as some grand revelation, and not something anyone who's ever considered the concept of preferences would treat as insightful. 
like I think most men don't want to date most women. Um, it turns out that a lot of people have highly specific things they're looking for in relationships, but to Aaron, this is just an assault on all that is good and true and holy. Um, he says this has been true throughout human history, which starts to undermine his assertion that the old contract arrangement was natural and desirable. He supports this with data indicating women were more likely to pass down their genes than men, something that actually doesn't prove women were attracted to the men whose genes they passed down uh, due to a lot of historical evidence indicating a lack of consent in genetic lineage, i.e. Genghis Khan and his hordes of rapists. He then says that there's a lot of evidence which proves women are less interested in having sex with men than the other way around, but ignores the social and biological burdens of pregnancy, and also the weird fact that women polled consistently enjoy having sex with women, something often attributed to fellow women knowing what they need to do in order to make their partners orgasm. He also provides one of the funniest citations I've ever seen, claiming that since women have much lower testosterone than men, we can estimate their interest in sex is only 6.7% that of men, which is both completely nonsensical. For instance, um, women do not have 6.7% of the body hair of men, and not what the paper actually says. The paper, his own citation, a citation he includes in this text, talks about biological sex differences between the sexes, not sexual activity differences. It discusses how men have 15 times more circulating testosterone than women, which is why there's differences in athletic performance, not that men are 15 times more horny. We assume he made this mistake both because he didn't do a good job editing and because he came up with points and then tried to find evidence to support them, not building a case around, you know, what the actual research says. He also says that there's differences in porn use between the sexes which is true, but his research doesn't even count some of the most common types of erotica women enjoy, and ignores that women masturbate without visual or written aids much more frequently than men. He says that there's differences in the total number of male and female prostitutes in the world, which ignores, of course, the fact that either sex can use either type of prostitute, but also the fact that women face serious consequences like assault and pregnancy when seeking sex workers, and that male prostitutes used by women has actually increased significantly in the last decade in places which have legalized sex work. Uh, and then he says that women don't respond positively when approached and bluntly asked for sex, but men do, proving less interest. Uh, we dug into all of that and found that for the last one, the research supporting it is quite interesting. It both postulated similar interests in casual sex between the sexes, but greater risk for women, as we've said, and found women more likely than men to agree to dates when approached by complete strangers, perhaps indicating that women are not nearly as picky as Aaron wants to make them out to be. He then does some truly jaw-dropping statistical analysis. He takes multiple different unrelated stats about sexual activity that all have different methodologies and examine different things and averages them together. Great. Uh, he concludes that women must have only 7.6% the interest in sex as men do. Uh, again, he just took all of these random pieces of research, averaged them together, and said, clearly this proves that women have, you know, 1 15th, 1 14th the total interest. Um, again, this is someone who claims that he's an economist doing perhaps the worst statistical analysis I've ever seen, and I've taken entry stats courses. <laughs> he then moves on to attraction and said that there's lots of research indicating women find 80% of average men unattractive. We pulled this research uh, from an OKCupid blog and noticed a small issue. The author didn't control for the quality of photos used. Uh, if you look at the photos that they talk about, the men's photos were much lower in quality than what the women on average provided. The top quality photos were also the photos ranked most attractive. Uh, this was limited to a single sample of OKCupid users from 2009, which may or may not be related to dating preferences in the greater population. He then says women swipe right on dating apps far less frequently than men do, something which multiple studies point out is likely due to there being far more men than women on nearly every dating app. He even sort of acknowledges this reality in chapter one and two. Given that women have so many more options, they can thus apply a lot more discretion than men for looking well looking for partners. It's not that they don't find most men unattractive, it's that they don't have the time to filter through profiles and immediately jump out to them. Weirdly, several of the sources indicate that women chat more um, than men do on most dating sites. They also send longer messages than men do. Very, very few women open with like, hey, what you doing? And they also spend more time on dating apps than men do, indicating genuine interest and engagement by women in the dating market. Uh, one of the studies also points out that women and men's behavior is different, likely due to skewed gender ratios. Um, that's, again, one of his own sources, just counting what he's trying to say. Uh, men have fewer options, and so swipe on as many people as possible and only filter when they get matches. Women tend to filter immediately prior to matching, indicating that they're chatting only with people they're genuinely interested in. 
Finally, he says women almost never ask men out, undermined both by his own sources and uh, my own personal experiences, that women must not be interested in serious relationships because they initiate divorce more frequently than men. And of course, that couldn't be due to male infidelity, uh, abuse, or chore distribution, and that women rank finding a partner or relationship lower than their career goals. Uh, That was an interesting one. The last argument is supported by a research study that looked at the preference of single women in their late 20s to early 40s. Uh, That's a group that has probably already decided whether or not relationships were important to them. It did not pull people who were actually in relationships, something which might indicate they considered that thing a priority. Um, I did pull some stats here and found that 91% of women in that age group were in relationships, 13% married with no children, 30% married with a child, and 12% without a spouse, but with a child. So more millennials have actually gotten together with someone, birthed a child, and then split up and been separated than are living by themselves, not interested in relationships. So again, just completely off base, not even looking at his evidence, or maybe thinking that he doesn't need to look at his evidence because no one's actually going to check it. He then concludes by saying women are interested in some men, but that they have this deluded idea that they all deserve six foot tall, ripped, rich alpha chads, and thus are passing up good men to chase this fantasy, and everyone who's not that is just wasting their time. Um, This may be really obvious, but we tore into this, pointing out that both men and women obviously have unrealistic expectations of reality at times, especially 18 to 24 year olds, say 18, 24 year olds that Myron brings onto his podcast to make fun of. It takes time in the dating market to identify what's realistic, and many people settle down with a partner who, believe it or not, is not their platonic ideal. Um, I found it difficult to believe that there's a single person who says their partner is perfect, that they don't want them to, you know, lose a few pounds or stop leaving the toilet seat up or think that they fart too much in bed. Uh, The difference is people in happy relationships realize that the positive aspects of their partner outweigh the superficial and typically realize that over time that the superficial doesn't mean as much as like the contentment the rest of the relationship brings. Um, Speaking of men, men have unrealistic ideas about women too. Uh, thinking that the average weight of women is nearly 50 pounds lighter than what it actually is. Like they think the average weight for women is 124 pounds, which might be due to watching a lot of porn or media that depicts that size of woman, but the average is actually about 172 pounds. Uh, One might argue that gives them unrealistic expectations of what they look for on dating apps, but Aaron, of course, completely ignores that. So this whole chapter is about how men need to accept the truth that women are interested in them, but the evidence is incredibly weak and often undermines his assertions. Women are indeed interested in men. Um, I think what a lot of people just need to accept is that the dating market is hard to get into. There's a lot of men out there who want to find relationships. There's a lot of women out there who don't want relationships because they've been burned in the past, and it's going to be difficult overcoming that barrier with the current form that dating has taken. That doesn't mean women have absolutely no interest in men. It means that A lot of women are not at this point in time putting in the same level of commitment to finding a relationship as the average man might. Chapter six, violating the contract. So this chapter deals with how Aaron feels women have not upheld their end of the contract, providing sex and exchange for resources, but are still reaping all the resources and rewards men used to give them because they secretly control all the levers of government education and the economy. Um, You can substitute any other conspiracy theory about who rules the world um, and, you know, not use the word women. Um, He's following exactly the same pattern. He also crams in a number of other grievances with women after he said his main argument. None of them really flow together and probably have been better as separate chapters, but intellectual cohesion or reading flow were not priorities for him. The evidence given is incredibly cherry-picked, as one might come to expect, but there's also an ideological tilt to this chapter that we discussed at length. Basically, Aaron is following the same pattern fascist leaders use to victimize minority groups and convince their populations to seize control and right society. We compared Aaron's rhetoric to Umberto Eco's 14 points of fascism and notice how closely they resemble one another. Aaron is painting a photo of a mythical better past. He pretends as though all dating relationship patterns have already been perfected. He paints women as invaders to society, coming out from the rightful place in the home to take men's jobs, etc., etc. One big piece of rhetoric that Aaron uses over and over again is one common to fascist movements, one where you paint the minority group that you're opposed to as all-powerful and corrupt, abusing their control of systems to harm the true patriots of a country, but then also paint them as weak and stupid so you can convince people that a simple show of force is enough to overturn their influence. It really doesn't make sense, as we discussed earlier, and about to echo notes this is why fascists have difficulty estimating the true strength of their enemy. Um, if you treat them as both all-powerful and all-weak, you'll never really know like what they're actually capable of. In this case, women are in control of all all major institutions per Aaron, but also are more stupid than men and overly vain. So if men could just get their act together, they could take back the power. 
Aaron actually wrote about the problems of women voting on one of his econ blogs, Captain Capitalism, in 2015, and concluded unhappily that while it would be great if women and non-property owners couldn't vote, the best thing to advocate actually would be to support a law which only allows taxpayers to vote. Uh, the fact that this would bias government significantly towards the interests of the wealthy either didn't occur to him or just didn't matter. Chapter 6 opens with a completely ahistorical and kind of racist analogy of Native Americans and cowboys trading turquoise for alcohol. Um, we checked, and what he comes up with like is a situation that almost never could have happened in the history of trade. Aaron says this is what historical relations between men and women are like, with one side showing up to trade when they wanted for what they wanted. Unfortunately, he says Native Americans, actually uses the word Indians, um, have learned to brew their own alcohol and no longer need the cowboys, in this case, men, which leaves us in the modern dating world. Um, again, it's not that women aren't interested in all men, it's that they only want to trade with the top 5% of men, according to him. So Al Aaron also seems to ignore the devastating impacts alcohol has had on Native communities, which maps on nicely to how women have been historically treated by men. So he acts as though like there's no reason Native Americans would no longer want to trade, while having an analogy that provides the exact reason Native Americans might no longer want to trade. Aaron says women's disinterest is a problem because men are biologically programmed to desire sex above anything else. He also says explicitly men cannot live without sex. We did a little analysis in the number of sexless males in the United States and the number of annual suicides and did not see a connection. There's also very little connection between the amount of sex people have for the relative happiness. This is a difficult thing to track. There's a lot of different data that's kind of meshed together that you have to play off each other. Um, but the general trend seems to be, yeah, people who don't have a huge amount of sex tend to be just as happy as people who have a large amount of sex. Turns out having a lot of sex isn't a overall guarantee of happiness. Aaron then says, because women have very little interest in sex and men have incredibly high interest, women exploit this control to get whatever they want. He then decides to backtrack and bring something up that he should have put in the old contract chapter, saying men were historically responsible for making all of society work by themselves in order to fulfill their end of the contract. Once again, this is untrue. Women have always contributed insane amounts of labor in both the economy and external to it through things like homemaking and childcare. Uh, new research indicates, as we mentioned before, that throughout U.S. history, 50% or more women have contributed to the economy and the labor force. Uh, and that's, of course, completely excluding the millions of labor hours doing household chores like food prep, cleaning, or mending. But to Aaron, of course, women had never been responsible for anything. He says when they began to enter the labor force is when the new contract began. Um, again, not really specifying an exact date, and they failed to do any of the actually important work, forcing men to do all of the truly important jobs in society, like plumbing and being an electrician. And this is when things went wrong, because society, rather than forcing women to step up, allowed them to do simple and unimportant tasks like nursing or teaching. Most people listening might also raise an eyebrow at this. I think very few people uh, would describe nurses and teachers as lazy and doing unimportant tasks, but to Aaron, doing these things shows how uninterested they are in being productive members of society and how they're mooching off of the hard work of men. We had a couple issues with this outside of the arbitrary standards he places on important and unimportant work. Uh, a couple of examples are that all organizations thrive by having specialized roles for members. Delegating different tasks to different people is a really good form of efficiency, one that should be familiar to self-professed economists. There's also significant amounts of research indicating that women entering college are pushed into majors tied to jobs with lower wages, even when their career goals match those of their male counterparts. Uh, there's evidence that there's not a lot of training funds available for women who want to learn the skills necessary to enter other fields. There's evidence that women working in male-dominated industries usually leave after several years and attribute it to long-term harassment and disrespect by their peers. There's evidence that when a significant number of women enter an industry formerly dominated by men, the wages of that industry drops. There's also the fact that there's very little stopping men who would want to be teachers or nurses from entering those professions. If they were indeed that easy, it would seem men would be flocking to them. But they don't, and that's likely due to the low pay, long hours, and limited respect people in those roles can command. Aaron says even beyond profession, women just work less total than men do, providing some stats that show women do work slightly less total hours, but a big discrepancy is due to women taking more sick time off. And a big part of that sick time off is explicitly them using FMLA leave, a federally guaranteed period of 12 weeks that men and women can use to take care of a newborn. People are guaranteed 12 weeks of leave, but none of that actually has to be paid. It very it depends on the company, it depends on the state, but like for, per federal standards, you can just give 12 weeks of unpaid leave leave to individuals. You just you know have to guarantee their job for that long. It's not even that women and some men are taking advantage of their employees' generosity, but even if they were, it really wouldn't be a bad thing because that'd be part of a total benefits package that people get as a condition of their employment. 
The sick time aspect is interesting too when you dig into the data because women go to the doctor much more frequently than men, which is one of the reasons they tend to live longer is they follow up quickly on medical problems they notice. They also tend to work in fields that involve dealing with more children or sick people than men tend to. So the likelihood that they're getting sick more frequently and that's just an integral condition of their employment is pretty high. This also ties back to another element of fascist thought that only productive members of society deserve respect. It's why both fascism vilifies or ignores disabled people and why fascism is so closely tied to business interests. Here, Aaron betrays the only thing that matters to him is economic productivity. He also gets confused here and doesn't read his sources because he talks about how there are worthwhile and non-worthwhile jobs, giving as a just random example, accounting as a worthwhile job that men do. And then he provides this link to a Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, website where you can check what percentage of professions are made up of men and women. And when you click through on that, women comprise 58% of the total accounting workforce. So again, just a wonderful, high quality use of stats. It's definitely not him talking out of his ass. Aaron then says women support their laziness by constantly voting for welfare programs, something that ignores the tens of millions of reliably conservative women voters in the United States and the tens of millions of men who also vote for welfare policies. He glosses past one of the sources he uses to support this, a website called Adivisionaries, which heavily promotes explicitly racist and sexist ideology. The website not only writes at length about the problems of mixing races and giving women rights, but then links to dozens of books through Amazon affiliate links that cover topics like racial differences in IQ or Europe being destroyed by hordes of filthy immigrants. Adivisionaries is not a website that comes up in many Google searches, so one can only assume this is the content Aaron has used to inform himself about econ in the world for literally years. The evidence is also a laughably bad piece from the University of Chicago that argues government spending on both the local and federal level expanded significantly after women's suffrage. Um, besides ignoring the obvious reasons for this, like the popularity of socialism in the United States in this era and the recent end of a world war that had monopolized significant amounts of government revenue, the piece ignores the fact that millions of women didn't vote when they obtained suffrage, lagging 20 points behind men's participation until the 1970s. Uh, part of this was social pressure. Part of this was parties not pushing for women to vote in areas that were non-competitive. Part of this was just women believing personally that they shouldn't participate in men's world of politics. So whatever policies were passed during this era were passed not due to women, but due to a mix of women and what must have been millions of men, which perhaps indicates that many people who are reasoned, rational individuals see the value of socialist thought, but I, I digress. The main argument is over, for this chapter at least, but Aaron decides to throw in some other miscellaneous thoughts and grievances with society prior to closing the chapter. He says that women have voted in cushy welfare programs to support their breeding with deadbeat dads, which makes every responsible man a cuck. Phrasing which is uh, coded, but also very much not coded. He calls the men whose tax dollars support single mothers slaves, which is a, another interesting but unsurprising turn of phrase. This, of course, ignores that the birth rate has been in decline for decades, reaching a new low of 1.64 births per women, down from 3.68 in 1960, which we guess means women have gotten much more terrible at exploiting men, per his own logic. He then says that they just go on dating apps to toy with men's feelings, which seems interesting given his earlier evidence that women spend more time on apps than men and open more consistently with longer, more detailed messages. He says men should consider what other things they could do with their time other than dating, and says you could have $3.6 million in investments when you retire if you just spent 90 minutes a day working. Um, I guess that's 90 minutes that would have otherwise been spent on dating apps. We did the math and it doesn't work out unless you retire at age 73, five years from the average age of male death. It also assumes absolutely nothing bad happens to the market in that time and a 12% interest rate, which is generous. Um, this also ignores that a lot of people either don't get to create their own schedules, they don't get to say, hey, Mr. Jenkins, I'm coming in at these hours, or they work salary jobs that don't give them more money if they work longer hours. He complains about how exploitative OnlyFans streamers are. Yeah, that's just kind of random. Again, just a lot of grievances about women in society. And he says that the economy would grow by tens of trillions of dollars a year if people stopped wasting their time on the site, which, based upon current figures, means the economy would expand 25% overnight globally if the OnlyFans site was shut down. Uh, we felt the need to support the sex workers here and point out that uh, the site is, um, you know, 
supporting people in a very difficult profession who are often there due to economic needs. Uh, but also per his own logic, if economic producti productivity is key, if you look at the average times people spend on OnlyFans, which likely indicates the time they need to orgasm, um, it's much lower than the amount of time people spend just randomly browsing porn sites. If you go somewhere for porn that aligns perfectly with your interests and achieve orgasm faster, one might think you would return to work faster, being a productive member of society. So one would hope that he would encourage this, but again, it goes against his own personal belief system, so it's not something that fits in neatly to his business is all good, economy is the most important thing to care about, philosophy. Then he follows that, uh, logical following, logical follow-up. Uh, he follows that by saying marriage is one of the stupidest things a man can do, as women don't care about being wives or mothers. One of his pieces of evidence for this is that too many women send their kids to public school rather than homeschooling. We checked and homeschool kids are less likely to attend college than their peers, making it less likely that they'll become the accountants and engineers Aaron thinks are the most important roles in society. A big reason for this is also that many two-parent families have to have both parents working to support them, something that may indicate drawbacks to his loved and preferred capitalist system. Another piece of evidence that he provides is a scene in a fictional movie, American Beauty, where one of the main actresses asks her husband, played by Kevin Spacey, uh, weird he doesn't mention Kevin Spacey by name, to not spill beer on their expensive couch. Aaron says that this shows the perspective of the modern woman, without acknowledging, you know, the fact that it's fictional, that there's no reason her husband couldn't comply with the lesson outside of the movie, trying to hit the audience over the head that Kevin Spacey is the only one who's really figured life out, and that the attitude he's pointing to would now be 25 years old as the film was released in 1999. Hard-hitting evidence. And also, he really firmly goes out of his way to imply that he's on Kevin Spacey's side, which is um, not a good place to be right now. He then says, due to women's reproductive capabilities being limited compared to men, women get preferential treatment by society, which seems completely untrue in a lot of cases in Western society. I think a lot of women complain that they do not get listened to and that they get, you know, less than ideal work conditions and living conditions. Uh, but it's also definitely untrue in areas of Asia and Africa, where women consistently are malnourished due to other members of the families eating first. Uh, one of his other big complaints is custody hearings, where women are more likely than men to get full custody granted by the courts. Um, that's a big issue for like male right activists and i wanted to dig into this and i found that something like 90 percent of men never ask for full custody uh, also that men often display considerable ignorance of their children's needs during hearings um, since women are almost always the primary caregivers prior to their divorces and that only nine percent of custody battles are decided by courts it turns out most are settled with mutual agreement by both partners outside of a legal setting uh, this and other incredibly poor examples are used to demonstrate that women have received undue preference across society for years, setting him up to argue that it is time that men buck the trend and start doing more for themselves. I know this is going long. We only got two chapters and they're not nearly as long as chapter seven. Sorry, it's chapter six. Sorry. So chapter seven, you deserve more. They deserve less. Um, here, Aaron believes he's knocked out the argument that women are leeches, so he then spends this chapter explaining how men need to stop spending their time doing anything for women. Um, he then also says that it's okay to do things for women if you vetted them, and then he doesn't give any tools for vetting them. So, not really good advice. Aaron says the, the average amount of mi money men will waste courting women over their lifetime is $6.9 million. He didn't explain in this book how he came up with that, but mentions that you can find more information in another book written by Aaron Clary, The Book of Numbers. Unfortunately, this is one of the books that I read. I found in this text he believes men will spend $260,000 on women in the course of their lifetime. Uh, this is a stat that includes things like weddings and taking your wife out on dates and that if men just invested that money at age 18 you know because most people have a quarter million dollars in cash at age 18 you could have seven million dollars by retirement and that's another calculation that just presumes an incredible amount of things about the market not going completely belly up due to you know climate change Aaron says men have three resources that dictate all of your life's outcomes um these are time money and energy he ignores, of course, the fact that poverty is endemic across the country and that researchers can predict lifespan and average income quite accurately based upon the zip code that one grew up in. He says the biggest waste of a man's time is women and that men are better off going to the gym than sending through profiles for 90 minutes a day, completely ignoring the fact that one could do both, like swiping apps while spending time on an elliptical. Uh, this is also where he undermines his earlier argument by saying women are a huge drain on one's energy because they don't speak in a straightforward way. And the reason they don't speak in a straightforward way to men is because speaking out of turn of the past could lead to domestic violence. 
earlier, of course, he ignored the issues of domestic violence because discussing it would probably make more people understand that there are good reasons women leave a lot of marriages. Here he just uses it to say women are more annoying now that we don't hit them as much. This also reveals that the old contract probably didn't work at all if men were expected to protect their partners because per his own definitions, uh, men should protect their partners. And unfortunately, women could not expect that their partners would not hit them, which one would think is not a form of protection. Uh, of course, he then undermines that by saying while women have some valid concerns, they also have completely fake ones like stalking, something that all stats on the subject in the case is a big issue faced by both men and women, and that women are much more likely to experience it. Uh, so in order to get past all of these annoyances, Aaron suggests remembering two things. First, that most relationships are not going to work out because women are jerks who are more likely to ghost their partner than men are. Uh, this is really hard to prove. Um, this is not a stat that a lot of people capture. But given that men report more sexual partners than women and are happier being seen by society as sexually accomplished, it seems men would be more likely to leave an arrangement, any form of relationship pairing than women. Second, he suggests that people will remember the Buddhist maxim that desire is the root of all suffering and reject their desire for relationships. Uh, this is a complete misunderstanding of Buddhist thought. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could find one or two Buddhists who believe this, but majority of Buddhists, I think, would disagree. Uh, for Buddhists, desire of the material world is the cause of suffering, but desires of people through things like love is totally okay and well supported by their faith. Buddhists don't want people to be miserable. Um, that, in fact, is one of the goals of Buddhism, not being miserable. And um, they, they encourage relationships. They just think that there are certain things people should do mentally to live less stressful and more spiritually fulfilling lives. So here we have Aaron completely misunderstanding economies, politics, and now religions. Regardless, he says that there are certain policies that men can use to guide their decisions. These policies are actually just a set of generic but difficult to answer questions that men need to ask themselves every single time they consider doing anything for a woman. These questions are, who is my beneficiary? What are my costs? What are my opportunity costs? What is the realistic chance of return on my investment? And when I consider all of the above, is this worth it? Men should do this. They should do this process, not just for big picture questions like, you know, asking someone to marry them or helping them with their student loan payments, but also for more minor things like going on dates or helping women with their homework. So in this chapter, his advice boils down to not every woman is going to like you. Don't waste your time pursuing women who are indifferent to your existence, which, okay, isn't the worst of advice, but he really oversells it. And then he goes off on the rails by not giving good examples of what situations to avoid and what to look for and seemingly presumes that men can already spot whether or not they're into women or into them. Because if men couldn't spot that, they couldn't figure out whether or not they get a return on their investment, right? It, it, it's all kind of gobbledygook. He, he doesn't provide any like specific examples. He just says, don't spend money on women unless women are actually going to return your affections. And then doesn't tell you how to spot a woman who's going to return your affections. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he can't even guess. Maybe he does know and just doesn't think it's worth including. It's not helpful advice either way. Um, so besides being gobbledygook and kind of poorly sourced, this chapter just really isn't empowering. Men who have truly fully bought into their spiel actually aren't going to find any useful tools in here. What they're going to find is loneliness. And as we've discussed in these episodes where we discuss this chapter, we think it's far more likely this is going to lead to male outward violence rather than inward improvement, as he thinks men are going to do. Final chapter, at least the final chapter of genuine content, is chapter 8, Putting It All Together. In the last chapter, at least the last chapter that isn't advertising for hopefully better books, it all kind of falls apart. This would be where most writers would refer back to their prior arguments, maybe strengthen them further, tie some ideas together, generally put a bow on their work. Aaron does none of that, choosing instead to further contradict some of his earlier arguments, further attack women, and leave the reader a mess of jumbled half-baked ideas to muse upon. So he opens and says men are in a new era, unlike others in human history. Without women to pursue them, they now should have an opportunity to focus on themselves, and they shouldn't squander the opportunity. He says men should follow the words of the rapper Future, and chase a check, never chase a bitch focusing on their career over a relationship. Uh, this is interesting because earlier he said it was a bad thing that women focused on their careers over relationships. I guess it's okay if they've started the trend. This ties back to my earlier criticism of him valuing corporate production above intimacy, but I, you know, don't know if that's a new thing. This also ties back to my earlier criticism of him valuing corporate production above intimacy. He says men who focus on themselves will be happier, will be less sad, which is 
a separate idea, but also a way to be happier. Able to get revenge on people by making them envy who you become and have a more meaningful life. He says there's nothing society hates more than men who have their act together and are confident in themselves, citing Andrew Tate, credibly accused pimp and abuser, and other men who have been me too I mean, I discussed this and pointed out that there are actually many men out there who are living their best lives, who have a lot of respect from society. Men like Jason Momoa, Ryan Reynolds, Keanu Reeves. Um, They command respect probably because they're not credibly accused sex perverts. But I guess Aaron thinks that that's something men should be allowed to do in order to live their best life. Uh, He also then says men who focus on themselves will become more attracted to the opposite sex, making it easier to pick women up. He describes his platonic ideal man's life and where he ends up, which ends up being, no joke, a Nebraskan electrical engineer who does the books of a local engineering society for free, pursues his hobby of competitive chess, and is the most talked about man at all parties. Um, This really didn't sound counterculture to us in the way Aaron thinks it did. This sounds very much like some ideal figure parents want their kids to become, but not like a substantially interesting person. Uh, He says, however, that this is the exact type of man women want and gives a list of inferior men women would ever want to date, like soy boys who, you know, have their liberal arts degrees, uh, which is funny because these uh, descriptions he provided (laughs) resembles friends me and Naomi know who are married or in long-term relationships. But then he contradicts this by saying that women have too high of standards and cites the case of the Tinder swindler, where a con man convinced average women he was a billionaire. Aaron believes that only certain classes of people should date each other and takes this as proof women are completely delusional about their market value and not, you know, some scammers are good at what they do and if they weren't, they would get caught much sooner. He says the fact 10 or so women fell for this con proves that all women are delusional, ignoring that his platonic ideal relationship cited at the beginning of the book was one where women pursue men only for resources. This is why he says men now face something that he calls the Tom Brady gamble, um, where no matter how successful or attractive they are, women might still leave them, which contradicts his earlier assertion that women would never leave successful men like Jay-Z. This of course, completely undercuts his assertion that there exists such a thing as a top 5% man, because there's actually no man that women want in this scenario, and that men who work on themselves could actually attract or maintain women, a problem he just chooses to ignore. Instead, he ends the book by saying there is no point in dating or committing as women are flakes, and that all you can truly hope for from, from life is occasional sex, or in his exact words, excellence with a chance of tail. And thus he ends the main content of his book really positive, uplifting, helpful ending for the individuals who are reading this and hoping to get ahead of their problems. Um, Chapter nine does exist. It's called Resources. It's just several pages of other authors he thinks you should read, starting with none other than Aaron Clary. It's interesting because the last several chapters are like, don't waste any resources on women. It's a fool's errand. But then here he gives several authors who are pickup artists slash self-professed sex gurus. I guess this is like a just-in-case section, but also further reinforces the idea they didn't think critically about how his ideas function as part of the red pill pickup culture movement, right? Because he wants to pretend he's part of some rich lineage of knowledge, but his book, A, feels the need to lean on the advice of others, which makes his argument seem so much weaker and less authoritative, and B, actively rejects the advice these people promote. If you write a book about how women don't deserve your time and resources, you probably shouldn't promote books about how to waste time and resources picking up women. That kind of shows you're an idiot who has no idea what you've just written. And then, just in case you haven't felt like your money was wasted quite yet, an entire page at the end of chapter 9 just has the words, The End, like you've just finished a Grimm's fairy tale, which adds a very weird effect to your overall impression as you close the text. So if it isn't already clear, we're done. And this book is a complete clusterfuck. Apart from the issues with the arguments and evidence chapter by chapter, there really isn't idea cohesion across the book, something made even more confusing by the relatively short length. Um, One would think that if you have a really short book, the ideas would be tighter and more cohesive, and the longer the text, the harder it would be. But no, he just sloppily threw together a book in a weekend and considered it good enough. And promotes in one chapter a sexual resources relationship, says in another that women will never leave a man if they can provide them all they want, but then says and another that women are shallow and delusional for only going after men with resources and says men should not give women resources unless they vetted them, which he then doesn't give men the tools to do. Or he does, I guess, with his five questions, but unless men have perfect foresight, there's literally no benefit to using those questions because he gives men no way to tell if women are actually invested in them. It's all convoluted and sloppy and silly, but the fact that so many people have endorsed this wholeheartedly, again, 4.8 4.8 stars on Amazon, 2,200 customer reviews, indicates that these ideas appeal to someone. And this is really the danger. 
Aaron identifies genuine frustrations with relationships and dating that most people recognize and then uses that to build this elaborate web of misogyny that makes everything women's fault rather than, you know, government, big business, society in general. He acts like women are aloof and exploitative rather than just as frustrated with the dating market, turning them into the villain rather than a group that could work with men and change things for the better. He puts men in this hyper-enclosed bubble and doesn't even tell them to work with their friends, but rather to internalize all of their negative emotions and do things only for themselves, spending all of their resources completely on themselves, never for other people. I'd argue this is good, because he's not telling men to go like work with fellow men to burn down a now headquarters, but it also doesn't solve his audience's problems with loneliness and frustration. It just pushes them further into desperation and anger when this book doesn't solve their problems, which, as we said, will probably manifest as violence. Um, this is frustrating, really, truly frustrating, and we hope people recognize this book for the stupid, exploitative, cynical cash grab that it is. Hopefully this episode uh, saved you some time. I guess you didn't have to listen to 15 episodes. You just got to listen to me uh, run out of moisture in my mouth over the last hour and 20 minutes. Um, we did 15 episodes for this, as I mentioned at the beginning, which really dug into this in far, far greater detail. Um, maybe that was a little indulgent, but if you like are interested in any of the ideas I brought up here, I promise you we go and do a much deeper dive in the hour, hour and 20 minutes we spend section by section uh, discussing the evidence and bringing in our own stuff to counteract the horrible misogyny that he says. Um, we probably won't do a 15 episode series on a book ever again. Um, that said, you know, we may be desperate to fill airtime. So, uh, you know, it could happen. But uh, no, no, not, not, not something we plan on. We still plan to do a follow up episode where we kind of counter his narrative with some positive advice of our own to help people frustrated with today's dating market in a way that doesn't create incel terrorists. Um, we're not sure when that's actually going to be out. But, you know, if you're interested in this, if you you know want to get kind of a better perspective on dating, then, you know, this horrible dribble that seems to be appealing to a lot of people, uh, keep your eyes peeled. That's, so that's all I have for today. I do appreciate you listening to me and my horrible screechy voice for this long. Um, I, you know, I'm glad that it's not just Naomi you're coming to for this podcast. Um, you know, occasionally Joel has insightful things to say too. We do really appreciate you tuning in and listening to our summary of this far, 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 far too long saga. Um, it, it's nice to know that there are people out there who are just as interested in debunking this crap as, you know, we are. Um, if you have additional feedback and, you know, you think there's maybe something we missed, let us know. And who knows, maybe we'll have another episode where we just go back through and reevaluate all the points we missed initially. Uh, it's difficult to uh, see the trees when you're looking at the forest and even when you get down and look at them. But yeah, thank you again for tuning in and listening to what I have to say. Uh, it's been a long, long saga. I appreciate that people are still sticking with us. If you're a first-time listener tuning in, thanks for tuning in for the first time. I promise the rest of our content is uh, a little more interesting and engaging. I do have a sister who's my fellow co-host and uh, do a lot of episodes where we dig into similar material. So check us out. Um, I guess I should also mention we have a Patreon. If you think that this was stupid enough that you want to support us, um, all of our Patreon donations go to supporting important charities and causes. We've been giving a lot of money to trans organizations, helping out in states where um, being trans has been criminalized. Uh, but yeah, if you go and support us on the Patreon, we've got some exclusive content. We've got a dating map with fun things to do in Phoenix. We got behind the scenes information about some of the projects we've worked on for this podcast. And then a lot of our podcasts make it up there with video and transcripts and typically a week or more early. Um, so yeah, check us out. Uh, we appreciate you. I know I said that already, but just figured to underscore it. I appreciate you tuning in, and uh, hopefully you enjoy your week. Bye for now. We have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at at datetheseguys or visit datetheseguys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, please send an email to datetheseguys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash date these guys. We have behind the scenes information, early episode access, participation in polls, and exclusive access to a guy's sibling map of date ideas for the Arizona area. 
Since the world sucks right now, we are currently donating all Patreon proceeds to trans organizations like Trevor Project, a trans suicide prevention organization, and moving assistance funds for those fleeing states outlawing their very existence. Please consider becoming a member and supporting our work today.